Thank you everyone for returning to the speaker panel. I see you have two microphones so you get to share it, mm -hmm. pass it around and share it. Uh, I really appreciate you guys spending your entire day here with us because I know it's a sacrifice. Uh, most of you had, have paid to be here as presenters as, actually all of you have paid to be here as exhibitors as well as volunteering to be speakers. We do not pay our speakers. So they are all volunteers, and that was very generous. And I said it before, but I don't think any of them were in here. So I'm going to say it again in that they may gain a patient or two, a client or two by speaking, but they've sacrificed just as, as much as we have, just in a different way to get here. Some of them have flown here. They've taken the day off work. They've driven here. They've sacrificed from their families. Some brought their kids with them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to be here. So we've all sacrificed to be here, including them, you know, and, and they've made financial sacrifices to get here. They've stayed in hotels. They've flown. So we really do owe them a thank you. And it's all in the interest of helping us be healthier, helping us have less pain. So we really appreciate you being here, you teaching us, your sacrifices as well. So this is always the favorite part of the day. And when I put these videos online, this is always the most popular video because this is your time to ask all the questions you want to ask. So we will start. Um, we actually did not have any questions from online, which is kind of strange because there's over 9,000 people watching this live right now all around the world. A record for us, but every year we exceed our numbers, and you know, I'm surprised there's no questions. We'll continue to watch it, though. So you guys have the floor. Who has the first question? I will come to you. Of course, you're all the way in the back. You guys are going to make me get my exercise today. Good thing I brought my slippers. OK, Greg. Uh, this question will be addressed to Dr. Joshi. Uh, Dr. Joshi, as far as pain management clinics, I know that there are some which have been instituting a $100 uh, copay. I wanted to get your thoughts on that because I know it's not state uh, uh, induced. I know it's, it's doctor approval. Um, so just wanted your thoughts on that. Uh, copay. For what exactly? Uh, Copay to see the doctor. Uh, you have to pay a hundred dollars before you get to see the doctor. Well, we have, you know, I, I know there's a lot of deposits. Uh, we have a deposit as well, um, and uh, I know the practice. A couple practices that are in our building have deposits as well, and uh, I think that's going to be m probably more of the norm because of the high cancellation. Tension sort of issues, kind of like, kind of like buying a plane ticket. Um, you know, they, they, you know, if you cancel your plane ticket, you know, sort of like, you're buying a ticket is kind of like a deposit, and you don't get your money back unless you cancel ahead of time or whatever. Um, so I think, th so if, if it's a copay, or go copay or deposit, I'm not sure which one. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, so that way, you know, if you if you just don't show up, um, you know. There, there's some type of uh, skin in the game, if you will, right? Skin in the game. But, but I'll tell you, you know, you, you really, I mean, if, if someone doesn't show up and you block an hour for them, and this is like, doesn't matter any, any practice, that, that loss is far greater than $100. So it's, it's you know, so uh, yeah, I, I think that, uh, I don't think it's, it's, it's um, something that um, is done to punish patients. I think it's something to sort of say, hey, look, you know, we're taking time out for you. You don't, you know, be respectful on both sides. Um, but I don't think there's a copay. I haven't heard of a copay. Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, sure. Okay, next question. Make sure you clarify who your question's for, please. My question is actually to Dr. Smith because I discussed the ibuprofen issue with him between sessions 
And if you think it's okay, I want to repeat this since 9,000 people are watching. Um, I did a pediatric internship. I used tons of Tylenol. Okay, so Tylenol helps babies with fever and that's about it. The other thing is all the transplant societies are trying to get all, rid of all the Tylenol and the mixed products, Oxycontin, Oxycodone, and Vicodin, because you can kill your liver that way too. Not all these opioid deaths are due to the opioid. Probably many are due to the Tylenol. There's a lot of Tylenol in those preparations. I've used a leave a little bit. Don't like it myself. I've seen two fatal allergic reactions working in an emergency room. I was in thoracic surgery practice. I gave tons of Demerol, morphine, Toradol, name it. So I'm pretty, I've been around the block a lot of times with medications. I personally do not think there is anything as good as ibuprofen. I only use ibuprofen in medical marijuana now. One thing, the patients that are on opiates, sometimes you just say, hey, tomorrow try half of your opiate and take some ibuprofen. They come back, they say, my pain went away right away. It's, it's really, I think it's quite an amazing drug. There's a caveat. Um, in very poor communities where there are a lot of Medicaid patients, the patients want free pills. So they'll get the pharmacy to dispense 800 and 600 milligram oval big tablets. Guess what? They sit in the stomach. I remember GI bleeds when I was working in Louisiana from those gigantic pills, just like BC powder, which is aspirin. There'd be massive GI bleeds. But I have not in the last few years since the gel cap ibuprofen came out seen a single gastric distress, not a single one. And I'd probably prescribe, I don't know, I can't even count, swim, Olympic swimming pools full of ibuprofen capsules, not pills anymore. So that's just, I'm, I'm an advocate for ibuprofen and I, I'd hate to see it just go away in favor of some other drug. Well, answer your question or to carry on this discussion thread, I think ibuprofen is a very useful little drug, you know, in terms of really rapid pain relief and having some anti-inflammatory effect. The, the overall stats on NSAIDs is that they have a strong association with uh, gastrointestinal bleeding, and, and part of that is because you absorb them, they go systemically, they do good things for you, but it block the same enzyme that it blocks, the same chemical that it blocks in the body that makes you feel better also happens to be a chemical we need to repair the lining of our stomach or more accurately protect the lining of our stomach. So when we take a lot of NSAIDs, our ability to not let our stomach auto-digest itself <laughs> decreases. Um, but I agree with you, the something that's rapidly absorbed versus a, a big torpedo that's designed just to dissolve somewhere an hour later than it should have. In other words, cheap manufacturing is way better for people. So if, if they're gonna, you know, e even Costco makes a very nice uh, liquid gel. It's, it's, not a, it's not out of reach for most people to get a more absorbable form. And hey, I'd rather have someone getting by with uh, ibuprofen than getting into um, more suppressive drugs, opioids, et cetera. So I'm glad that you mentioned that. Sure, I'll chime in. You looked like you wanted to say something. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I've given, I've given um, so NSAIDs are another one of my sort of interests. Uh, I've given many presentations on NSAIDs, and um, long story short, because I know there's a lot of questions, uh, it's not that NSAIDs are, no one's doubting how good they can be from a pain relief standpoint. The, the issue is exactly, um, you know, like we discussed, which is safety. So, so, there was an article that came about uh, in 99 that um, just from GI-related deaths, okay, there were, there were about 17,000 GI-related deaths from ibuprofen or NSAIDs, you know? So when you look at it, if you look at that study, for example, and compare it to opioids, that's the same as prescription opioids per year. So it's not benign. So that's the problem. So what's that? What's that? I mean, we, we can look, I could give you that reference and you can dissect it all you want. But, but the point of all that is, you know, we're not saying one's, you know, we're not trying to compare one to another in terms of, oh, well, one extra person died here, so we should do this or something. We're just basically pointing out that, that there is a significant amount of risk. You know, there's, there's uh, about 80,000 people a year that go to the ER for GI-related NSAID 
bleeds and issues. Uh, there's a, a huge cost to society uh, with side effects from NSAIDs. So the, 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 the point is, is that um, just as much effort as we're giving toward um, getting uh, safer prescribing for opioids, we need to also have safer prescribing for NSAIDs. The, the problem we're going to see is, as this pendulum keeps swinging, is you're not going to die from this, now you're going to die from this, you know? And, and so what we need for NSAIDs is we need to pay attention to the molecule. You know, you had mentioned Toradol. Toradol is literally the most nephrotoxic drug on the market, hands down. Even more than the most dangerous chemotherapeutic drug. One dose and you can be in renal failure. I've seen it. I've seen one dose where you bleed out, you hemorrhage. I've seen it. And I've heard this from all across the country and I've given lectures. So Toradol is like, you want to, Toradol is like, like literally one of the most dangerous drugs out there. But people, people dose it like water and that's a problem. It, it, and, well, no, that, that's, that's a whole separate problem, actually. That's a whole separate problem. It's just that Toradol has a binding affinity for the COX-1 receptor that's up to 350 times more than ibuprofen. So you think ibuprofen's bad. Take Toradol and it's 350 times more. So the point is, molecules matter. You know, they're not all the same for NSAIDs or even opiates or anything, right? And technology matters, which you had touched on, too. How is that product formulated? You know, your generic ibuprofen is formulated like a bomb. You take it, and it explodes in your stomach. Whereas some other formulations don't do that. So, so that matters as well. So there's actually safer versions of the same molecule. There's safer versions, and they're more dangerous versions. So. Uh, okay. uh, you're not, you're uh, not uh, mine. I'll tell you after. Uh, you're yeah. not mine. Yeah, and we need in to terms other of, questions. In terms of brands and all this stuff, I don't want to get into it now. We'll just do it afterwards, yeah. Okay. Okay, so we have some online questions. And uh, the first one is for Dr. Joshi. What can one expect when getting a ketamine infusion, and how quickly can you tell what it will do for you? What can one expect? Well, it depends on where you go. Um, I think there are a few, uh, a few providers who have done, you know, um, hundreds or thousands of infusions, and they specialize in it, and they're anesthesiologists, they're pain specialists. This is what they do. They give the patient a comprehensive diagnosis and treatment. And I think that the um, outcomes for those are vastly different than, um, than the person who pretends to do an infusion. In fact, just today I've talked to multiple people in the audience who have gone to different places where, you know, they had uh, just some random person doing it, and, uh, and it, was, it was horrible. I had, I had one gentleman who came up to me and said uh, his son had it by some anesthesiologist who works in the OR who was paid cash, then he outsourced it to some nurse who um, kept the patient there uh, and um, was um, electrolyte depleted, was not hydrated, was going through hallucinations, was having a horrible experience. That is not what you expect in a properly done infusion. Properly done infusions are done pretty smoothly, and they can be diagnostic as well as therapeutic. So this is where you really need someone, I think, who, who understands you know, comprehensive pain management, knows not only how to customize an infusion for that patient, um, but also someone who understands how to, how to use that as part of their treatment plan and part of their diagnostic plan. Uh, but, but all in all, you know, uh, most people, if not all, almost all people, do not experience these horrible side effects that people think are supposed to happen. If you have horrible side effects with infusion, there's something that needs to be changed. There's something that's, that's you know, we've probably seen like horrible hallucination stuff in less than 1% of our patients, so. As a ketamine patient, I would agree with that. Okay, this question is from online, and it would go to any of the doctors on the panel. So any of you that do charge a deposit for the appointment to secure that they come, does that deposit go towards the appointment and or treatment cost once they show up for their appointment? Does it go towards the appointment, or is it just Pocketed. You, know, you know what I'm asking, right? Well, I guess I'll answer it first because I had a question already. Um, for us, yeah. I mean, for us, it, it okay. goes toward their, you know, their whatever okay. their, their... So, Atletico? Due. So, um, we don't have a deposit that is required prior to physical therapy services. Um, what your provider, your insurance carrier um, is worked out as far as a copay would be different. But there is no... Right, right that's a separate... Just deposit. There is no deposit. Okay, so uh, the National University of Health Sciences no Clinic. Deposit. Okay. Are there 
I have another one online, but let's get to some in-person questions here. Helen? Hi, my name is Helen Small. I'm from Canada, and I run the CRPS charity in Canada. Hi, guys. <laughs> Um, there has been a significant development uh, with a receptor called the SIL2R receptor in the development of a test for CRPS. Could anyone explain this for us? All right, moving on. Okay, <laughs> another question? In the, okay, I see a couple of hands. Um, I'm Amanda Vandevoort from Displains. I run the Displains Chronic Pain Group. Um, for Dr. Hamilton, I noticed you and Dr. Dr. Smith also mentioned um, butcher's broom, and alpha, uh, you mentioned alpha lipoic acid. Um, I was told if you take alpha lipoic acid, you want to take it with butcher's broom because they work in conjunction with each other. Is that correct? Dr. Smith? Uh, could, you, could you repeat the co-substance <laughs> that you were mentioning? Um, butcher's broom and oh, alpha lipoic broom. acid in conjunction instead of just one or the other separately. I, I can't think of a reason why that would be a must. I mean, butcher's broom is a nice um, connective tissue tonic, but I, I can't think of a a reason why that would be a, 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 a co-activator. I've actually given ALA without giving butcher's broom and it's worked, you know, fine. So yeah, I'm not familiar with the, the two having to be together. Um, my question is to any of the doctors on the panel. Um, is it common practice in hospital training, medical training to teach the people about CRPS? and about the hospital protocol to deal with CRPS patients? Because I run into many doctors and nurses that have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Joshi? <laughs> I just want to repeat that. Many doctors and nurses have no clue. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> I've never seen so many people want to hand me a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, 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 so, so beyond CRPS, I mean, this is actually a major problem and, and still to this day in all medical schools across the country. Forget about CRPS. There is no formal pain management training. I mean, it's, it's pretty pathetic. Uh, wouldn't you agree? I mean, it, it's, in, in fact, even in residency, okay, there's no pain management training. Even in anesthesiology, you, you have to say, well, I kind of want to do a pain management rotation as an elective. I mean, it's, it's pretty sad. And so we've known this for many years, decades, and, and actually, I mean, just a lot of us have been sort of fighting for saying, hey, we need to have some education. There's nothing. So maybe, you, you know, maybe there's someone out there saying, well, my medical school, I had a day. I had an hour. I mean, okay, that's not training, okay? We need like a whole semester because when you think about it, the whole field of medicine is pain management. You go to someone because something's bothering you. That's the definition of pain. If something emotionally or sensory is bothering you, that's the definition of pain. So if, as far as I'm concerned, the whole entire medical training process should be shifted, and we should be looking at, you know, kind of like Jeopardy. You have the answer, and you have to tell someone what the question is. The answer is, hey, someone's coming with this symptom. How do we backtrack it and figure out the diagnosis? That's not how medical school is taught right now. So pain management is totally not taught right now. Okay. Uh, I wanted to chime in real quick sure, from a physical sure. therapy standpoint. Um, I mentioned briefly um, when I was speaking about there needing to be a mind shift in the field of physical therapy. Um, just kind of on the heels of what Dr. Joshi was saying, how that a day is not enough. Physical therapy uh, school is the same way. There's like we touch on chronic pain and then let's move on. It, it doesn't, it's not something that, um, it's an entry level um, type of treatment that that we should be providing patients with. Like when you're doing your due diligence, trying to find a physical therapist, make sure that you find someone 
who is comfortable, has taken some continuing education courses, has some type of experience in treating patients with chronic pain. Uh, because it's not something that you'll come out of PT school ready to treat. It's something that you'll have to extend yourself a bit to learn more about. And as the, uh, the woman just said, it's, it's something that really requires you listening to patients and seeing how patients respond to certain treatments and being able to adapt and adjust your treatment plan based on their response to um, your interventions. So. Yeah, I wish we could just touch on chronic pain and move on. Right. 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 <laughs> exactly. Wouldn't that be nice? Is there a question? Okay. Just a question to Mitch. Uh, I'm not sure what's the difference between uh, like patients getting medical cards for cannabis and going to a dispensary when there is so much online, like Charlotte Webb and several other, that patients can just go online and buy CBD. I'm not sure what's the difference. Why, why is that? So CBD is a little bit different than all of the products that the dispensaries in the state of Illinois sell. Anything that has above a 0.3% THC level is federally illegal to ship across state lines. So there are companies, and I believe Charlotte's Web is one of them, um, in Colorado that have a hemp bill, and they are permitted to produce that oil and ship it out of state because they're operating under the federal farm bill, basically, as hemp. Um, they, you would not be able to get products that have higher THC levels unless you have a medical card state by state, and then you have to keep that within the state lines. Now, I will tell you that there's a panacea around CBD, and a lot of people are looking online, and they're buying um, from any number of websites, and it's not all created equal. You're likely going to get a lot of imported stuff from China, that you know who knows how it was grown were pesticides used so i really encourage people if they're going to buy online to try to buy it from a u.s based company like in a state like colorado where you can actually you know get people on the phone know how they're growing it know how they're making that oil um, and make sure you're getting the real deal otherwise you're wasting your money at best and you know hopefully you're not hurting yourself with pesticides or something with something you're not familiar with so to expand upon that question, um, isn't it accurate that the best concoction for pain is a one-to-one -one ratio of T THC and CBD? It is. So for pain treatment, you're going to want a little bit elevated um, THC. And THC and CBD modulate one another. So a lot of people say, I don't like that feeling of, of getting high or being psychoactive. And that one-to-one, -one, I always tell people to try it at night try before you go to bed. You know, hopefully you'll just sleep through it if you're gonna have any effects. Um, but you're right, Gracie, that is really a very good combination. And another thing we're learning as we're getting more research is that terpenes are very important. Um, myrcene, beta caryophylline the terpenes that are naturally in that plant um, can also be helpful for pain. And, you know, herbalists will tell you that. It exists in a lot of different plants. So that's another aspect that's helpful. So I was just gonna say, typically all the questions are about cannabis and none of them had been and the first question about cannabis was from a doctor. Yeah. So. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, I'm coming, Greg. Oh, we're in the back of the room again. <laughs> Mitch, to follow up that follow up, uh, with Illinois stringent laws uh, with THC and CBD, there's only one test that can be done. Is that correct to determine, for instance, if your employer's workplace, uh, they don't, they're not able to determine if I'm using the freeze compound, which is devoid of um, THC, but it's all CBD for my ankles. I I believe that the typical tox screening is presence of cannabinoids. But I do believe that there is a test that they could do to learn whether which of the compounds are present. Most people don't do that. The right. normal drug testing is just a straight tox screen. Is there any um, further advancement that obviously with it being in its infancy, is there a push towards uh, maybe more of a mindset 
that some people are using it not necessarily for that recreational eye? Right. I, I think what's going to happen is you're going to, there's a lawsuit right now, um, a man that's worked for UPS almost 20 years. He is a paraplegic and um, takes CBD during the day, which is not a psychoactive effect at all, and then takes some THC at night, and they're drug tested. And clearly he's not driving a truck or anything. He has a desk job, but they fired him. So that is now sort of a landmark case that people are watching. And it's good that it's a big, you know, reputable, recognizable company. I think we're going to see some uh, bending of the rules. And you'll probably see it starting with the tech industries, you know, the younger people that understand and, you know, can separate that you're using this as medicine, and if you're using it at night, it's like somebody having two glasses of beer. You know, they don't the next day tell you you can't work because you had those two beers. So it's gonna take a little bit longer, as will insurance companies starting to reimburse this, but you know, we're all very hopeful, and I think you'll see the industry really get behind that. It's, if I can just interject, it's a, out of my area of expertise, but I think where that will end up going is under the Americans with Disabilities Act, yeah. where that's not an unreasonable accommodation for an employer to make um, that will still allow someone to do the essential functions of their job and continue functioning. So I, my, without being involved in the litigation, um, I would be almost certain that at least one of the theories for that employee um, is under the ADA, and that's hopefully a good theory. Okay, I have quite a few questions from online, so if you could hold off a moment. I'm going to start firing these away. Um, okay. So the first one, considering several inherent genetic mutations and some slight increased propensity of anatomic variants in redheads, <laughs> how are those patients handled? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Joshi, how do you handle those dang redheads? Uh, well, I, I think you know, in anesthesiology, we we uh, the first the first day, first week, you know, you our attending. Shake attendance. your head when you see them coming. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, we uh, every anesthesiologist you ever meet, you know, if you ever meet an anesthesiologist, just say, so, um, tell me about redheads. Yeah. And, um, and they'll all tell you, oh my gosh, you so know. Difficult. Uh, it's a nightmare, because uh, they, they, you're right, uh, they just, you know, they're, it's, it's harder to anesthetize, you know, when they wake up, they, they tend to be a little less predictable. Um, That's so, all the time. <laughs> So it, uh, I, I remember, uh, I'll never forget this, because we had this one case, it was a young, young guy, probably young 20s, uh, weighed about 240 pounds, you know, all muscle, right? And he, and he had red hair. And uh, this is during residency, and we're waking him up, he's coming out of anesthesia, and oh my gosh, we had eight people holding him down, because he was just like, you know, and you would have never predicted it, right? Well, actually we did, but you know what I mean. Um, yeah, no, you know, it, it's, uh, they, they've actually found that there is some, some uh, the, the, the question the questioner was correct uh, there are some genetic differences and uh, and uh, so, so it's more than just this anecdotal thing now we actually know that there are variances in how metabolism occurs uh, doesn't make it any more or less predictable you know but uh, but but it, so yeah this, she's not alone this this is something that we've known for a while yeah. I break all the rules by the way I'm the cheap date for the anesthesiologist <laughs> Lidocaine infusion has been recommended for me. What can I expect? What are the risks? And how does that differ from ketamine? I'm sorry all these questions are for Dr. Joshi, but I have more. Yeah. Um, lidocaine and ketamine are completely different things. Uh, lidocaine is an anesthetic. You know, I'm sure everyone knows what lidocaine is. Ketamine is a, uh, is a very complicated molecule. It's primarily an NMDA receptor antagonist. Uh, and it also has its effect on multiple different receptors, including resensitization of the mu receptor. It has an effect on the ampi receptor. It has ref an effect on various gene activation processes that occur. I mean, just completely different than just a numbing medication. So um, they, they should not even be used interchangeably. So if the doc is saying, oh, well, we could do a lidocaine infusion, we could do a ketamine infusion, we could do that, you know, 
it's possible that the doc doesn't know what he's talking about. They are not the same thing. <laughs> I say, why didn't you just throw in, oh, we do chemotherapy and infusion, and we could do, no, they're not the same thing, you know. Okay, I agree. Uh, I'm not really sure who to direct this question to. It says, why can't we get treatment in hyperbaric oxygen chambers? Um, we can get treatment in hyperbaric oxygen chambers, so I'm not sure who to direct this question to. But it, they go on to say, their state, which happens to be Delaware, only has one facility that's a Medicare facility, and Medicare only pays for diabetic sores. So I think that the heart of the question is, why doesn't Medicare cover hyperbaric oxygen therapy? Uh, none of you are providers of hyperbaric oxygen therapy, so does anybody have any input on hyperbaric oxygen therapy? If not, we'll move on. I think Jeff has something to say. So, so I'm going to switch that question around to something okay. I alluded to. So pardon my diverging for a minute. Sure. Why won't Medicare cover a particular treatment? Earlier I told you that not everybody has to wait for Medicare after disability because if you're on kidney dialysis or you have Lou Gehrig's disease, you get it earlier. The answer for that is lobbying. The answer for that is politics. And more important for this group, the answer to that is speaking out. There's going to be tons happening in Congress in the next six months that's going to affect the lives of every single person in this room, whether it's the Affordable Care Act, whether it's Medicaid block grants, whether it's changes to Medicare, whether it's changes to how Medicare formularies work, whether it's whether we're going to help support more um, purchase of, of drugs or negotiation of drug prices at the Medicare level, all of that's going to come from Congress. Congress answers to only one group, you all. The problem is that Congress doesn't hear from you all. They hear from lobbyists. Lobbyists are very different than patients. Lobbyists care about their corporate interests. They don't care about the, into, uh, the interests of the patients. But congressmen do want to hear from you all. I'll spare the long story, but I met with a congressman a number of years ago who was not my congressman. He and I saw the world entirely differently. But what he said to me is, he only knows the stuff that's on his particular committee. He can't read as a congressman every army bill, every um, environmental bill, every health bill, every school bill, every road bill. It's impossible for a congressman to know everything. It's too big. What they count on is what they hear from the public. So pick up your email. If you have an issue with a Medicare issue and you think Medicare should cover more treatment, email your congressman or call him. They're nice people. They're, every congressman has a consumer advocate on his staff. They want to hear from you. They track every phone call. They track every email. They track every letter. And they write that, they expand that. If you send an email, they count that as representing a thousand of their constituents because they know that you're speaking for a number of people. You all can advocate, you all must advocate, or we're going to get run over by people that are not interested in the welfare of patients and the welfare of people that need help in this country. You must speak up. It's the number one thing on you, that you can do for yourselves and for the chronic pain community. Powerful statement. Nobody cares more about your health than you. Hi, this is for Dr. Joshi. Um, <laughs> uh, what's your opinion on immunoglobulin therapy for CRPS patients? Or do you feel like, I, I, I don't think they're to be used interchangeably from what I know, but do you see a value in in that? Um, you know, there, so there's some patients who have benefited from, you know, plasma phoresis uh, for a variety of conditions. I think CRPS inherently, if it's true CRPS, is, is a central pain condition, so theoretically it shouldn't respond. But what we end up seeing is that cascade of, of events that occurs when someone has an injury or CRPS, and they may benefit from plasma phoresis or IgG therapy um, as a subsequent event. You know, but it's, I, I don't think it's primarily treating the, the CRPS. 
That being said, logistically and financially, it's it's that's a separate you know discussion, and um, I, I don't see too many people having too much success getting that approved. You know, so yeah. So, but for pure CRPS, um, with just pure CRPS, it's not something that should theoretically be helpful. It's when you have all the secondary sequela. So this is, always has been, and always will be a patient education expo. But every year we get more and more doctors and nurses and medical students that register because they want to learn too. And we obviously have very high level presenters. So one of our online viewers has asked, how do providers try to get continuing education on pain management? And I love that question because there's a doctor watching that wants to learn more about pain management. So, pain professionals, I guess, on the, on the panel, all of you, how can the, the, the providers in our audience get continuing education on pain management? Uh, well, for one, um, I know that Evidence in Motion, which is a, um, a continuing education uh, program company that's out there for physical therapists, and I think um, therapists in general, um, really offers a lot of really good um, programs that you can kind of get into, like courses. That's what, it wouldn't be just one course. It would just be like more of a, like a, um, a program with maybe three to four courses that you take regarding pain management. There's some really good research, evidence-based um, information out there for physical therapists um, in particular. Um, and then they also infuse a lot of the research from pain management um, into different uh, programs as well. I've completed their um, sports certification program, and there was a lot of good material, good lectures um, that they incorporated chronic pain um, into uh, those courses as well. So I found it very beneficial. Um, even there are times when you're not really looking for, per se, education in that, but then it comes up, and it's, also, and it's always helpful. Um, I found a very good... Um, uh, instructor from, from one of the courses I took in the sports uh, therapy program that really kind of delved into chronic pain. And I can get that information to anyone who, who needs it. Um, feel free to email me at lathan.williams at athletico.com. That's L-E-Y-T-H-O-N. And I'll be uh, willing to point you in the right direction towards some of those instructors that really do well um, in you know, pointing therapists in particular into the right direction for chronic pain management. What else, Dr. Yeah, Josie say, and then Dr. Smith? Yeah, I'll just say for physicians, um, you know, there are a lot of different societies out there that have their own conferences, and I found that some of those societies tend to be very sort of shoehorned into a very specific viewpoint on pain management, for better or worse. Uh, I've been a big fan of Pain Week. Uh, I've lectured there for many times for the last, you know, many years. And um, the reason I think Pain Week is good for physicians, actually anyone can go there, so patients, physicians, anyone, it's open to everyone. Um, you know, you'll even see lectures that conflict with each other there because they allow for that open conversation from multiple different backgrounds. So it's a great place to get um, a lot of information on multiple types of pain management. I mean, everything from, you know, me, you know courses on meditation all the way up to high level interventional options. So that's always the first week of September, Labor Day week in Las Vegas. Dr. Smith? There's a, an Academy of Integrative Pain Management and on the, um, uh, I think it's rsd.org website, there's some physician resources on there as well. And uh, if, you know, you're a healthcare professional learning about this, the the whole acupuncture world has, you know, physician training at times, but a lot, a lot of permutations around pain management. So, um, some some of those things pertain to people who have really devoted their life to studying acupuncture, and some are more physician oriented. So, what's sometimes called medical acupuncture. Okay. So another from a, a physician. Any advice to connect like-minded physicians across the states? No. Okay. So. <laughs> just keep, That's you know, ask, yeah. on our own. That's okay. All right. So, yeah. 
Yeah, he was yeah. saying conferences. I think that would be like the best start to connect with one or two people who may know somebody who knows somebody who has a friend who knows somebody who can connect people um, until we have more organizations that connect us like this. It would be more of an individual basis, unfortunately. So come to the Midwest Expo. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I think I, I mean, I, you know, not to get off topic, but you know, um, yeah, I mean, connecting with physicians, like-minded physicians, is uh, uh, sure conferences, or you could just, you know, I mean, people meet somehow and they reach out and you know, LinkedIn, whatever. But you know, there's another site called Doximity. There's another site called Sermo. Those are all for physicians, and you have to actually be a physician, or they won't allow you to register. But the bigger issue, I think, is um, it's great if we all connect, but but we're running into a huge problem with once you connect, you still can't do anything because a lot of these physicians are now owned by a, by a large organization that won't allow them to do whatever it is that they want to do anyway. So it's great that you connected. Anyway, back to your day job where you're told yeah. what to do. So. Okay. Uh, okay. It's worth mentioning that RSDSA offers three different courses um, with CME credits, and they're available on their website uh, for anyone that may be listening or watching this. So please go to rsdsa.org. Uh, I'm going to take some more questions from our attendees here, because these online questions are going to go forever. Ooh, Ooh, careful. If I don't trip over my own purse. <laughs> this is for Mitch. The medical conditions list, um, we, many times we use trial and error for regular prescriptions. Why isn't it the same for cannabis, and how can we add to the list? Well, it is a little bit the same. Um, as I said, everyone has an endocannabinoid system, but we don't know, you know, really what someone might be lacking or have too much of. So um, depending on what the initial diagnosis is, we will suggest certain strains. And then that person will keep a log and come back and tell us how that worked. Um, you know, some people might say, oh, this kept me awake and I, you know, I, Go ahead. You, the sim Are you talking no. about conditions, conditions or strains? Conditions. So you're, you're asking how do we get additional conditions on the list? Yes. Um, well, we would love your help. Um, we have worked very hard with the state. We had set up as part of the law. There was a uh, committee that was put together with physicians headed by someone from Health and Human Services so people could petition to get new conditions put on. And every time we would get those petitions put on, people would testify. Um, at one point we had, I don't know how many veterans come out to testify to get PTSD on. Um, the, head, the guy in charge of Health and Human Services would say no to everything. And it really was a mandate from the governor's office. If people are willing to admit that, some people would say that they wanted it or they traveled to Colorado and they, other states where they could get it legally. Um, you know, but the truth of the matter is these, these people are desperate and it was obvious and we were all just being broomed aside. The bad news is they just disbanded that entire commission. And that was a trade-off with the governor and the legislature because he extended the pilot program another two years because it got started so late. So we believe now that for us to expand this program, we either need a new legislative effort and there's work right now happening yet this year in session, or we need a new governor. And I think that there are plans to try to get somebody else in there next year and people are literally running on being pro-cannabis, you know, candidates. So to your point, let your representatives know how you feel and what you want and how aggravating this is. That's, that's exactly right. It's a political question that will respond to you all if you get involved in the politics. It's sad that our medical needs are controlled by politicians, but it's our reality. The medical cannabis program in the state should have been expanded. It just absolutely should have been expanded. 
It was a political decision not to do that. Call your state senators, call your state reps, get them involved, let them know what's going on in your lives, let them know what your needs are. It's the only way to get the changes made. Uh, first, just a, a real quick comment that if, if you're a doctor or if you're a patient looking for a little bit more uh, training or focus on pain, there is the American Society of Interventional Pain Physicians, and that's ASIPP.org. That's one place to go. Great resource for, for clinicians as well as for patients. Then I have a question for doctors Hamilton and Smith, and this is a real simple question. Oh, we, we, we're told that turmeric or other curcumins um, should be taken for their anti-inflammatory problem or their function, uh, but uh, I've seen that uh, they, there's an argument of whether or not they need to be co-administered with piperine. So I'd like uh, to know what the latest uh, state of the art is on that. I'll start. Um, if you think about it, turmeric is food. And it's been around forever. And most of the cultures that use it widely, they use it with pepper and they use it with a fat source, so milk or something else. And it seems to work very well. So if you consider it that way, then yes, that is you know, the best way to do it. And research has found that you know, that is, in fact, a better way to have it administered as a food. So that's you know, kind of where I would start. Dr. Smith? Yeah, I'd, I'd concur with that. You know, my, my three words would be green curry chicken, just thinking of the prescription there. But if you think about the traditional diet, just like Dr. Hamilton says, there's a molecule that can get it into the body and then something that helps facilitate it, like, like pepperine. And, you know, the whole dietary supplements concept is interesting because it's oh, I think a uh, $40 billion, $50 billion inter industry now. I mean, Dr. Hamilton and I recommend dietary supplements to people a lot, but um, food is more important. So, yeah, the higher quality manufacturers uh, will usually package something like that in with it. And just an interesting thing, I, I read one of our best drug researchers in Illinois uh, Guido Pali, who's at UIC, published a paper about a year ago saying, you know, he, he's the real deal. I mean, he discovers new drugs and saying we should really give up on curcuminoids as a future drug. And then if you read the whole paper, he goes on to say how many health benefits it has. And what he's really saying is there's not one single molecule from turmeric that we can isolate, rip out of its context, <laughs> and synthesize that will just do a whole lot of things as a drug, but uh, as a family of compounds within a whole plant, taken as nutrition, it does am amazing things. And it reminds me a little bit of, of cannabinoids in that there's, the more we look at it, there is a type of synergy there if we're willing to look at the data from different perspectives. Okay, this is an online question. It, it's a pretty hot topic. Uh, kind of hesitate to ask it, but it is a hot topic. So I have heard about an herbal supplement called Kratom. People swear by it for chronic pain. Are you familiar with this supplement? If so, what are your feelings about it? So whomever would like to take that one. I've never heard of Kratom. You've never heard of Kratom? No. We have okay. stores in, in yeah. Missouri that are Kratom stores. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't even know what the basis of it is, but okay. Well, the DEA was going to pull it, right? And, and now they stopped them, halted. Right. So, uh, and and Fraser, Dr. Smith is holding his head. I'm, I'm searching the memory banks, but oh. I can't do it. <laughs> okay. Well, Dr. Joshi's yeah. got the mic up. So. No, I mean, you, you know, look. Uh, you, if you remember, what's the what's the Hippocratic oath, right? Do no harm. Uh -huh. So it's impossible. I think it's impossible. Uh, for, for any, any uh, physician or medical professional to say, hey, this is great, when we know so little about what it can actually do. You know, it's kind of like the big craze now. And, you know, who knows? We may find out that, that there are safety, you know, the safety um, um, 
benefits or whatever. But, but we don't know yet, so there's no way you can advocate for that. And until you can actually truly scientifically analyze the compound and the safety and the efficacy and stuff, you know, uh, there's no way that any medical professional can advocate for that. You know, we, we look at other compounds. There, there's, they are dangerous and they work, but at least we have data and we know what our margins are. So um, I, I would absolutely say do not mess around with things that you don't know. So not knowing what that particular herb is, just speaking on herbal medicine in general, um, I love herbs. Herbs are beautiful medicines um, traditionally and even scientifically now that they're learning more about them. If it is an herb that has been used traditionally, then use it in that traditional way until we learn more about it, if you're going to use it. If you start to use it outside of the way that they have been used traditionally, then you run the risk of coming into even more problems than, in the, than you were in the first place because it's not used in the way that it has been used for hundreds of years. So that's just my stance. With cannabis, with any of the herbs that are out there, if you're going to use them, if there's no research or there's not a lot, go to an herbalist who knows the history of that herb and can at least educate you on it that way so that you know the history of how it was used while they learn more about it. Okay, thank you. Questions in the audience? Okay, we'll take just a couple more. Where'd you go? Can you put your hand back up? Oh. I just wanted to clarify something that you just said about doctors um, networking and then they go back to their I don't, did you say like big companies or mm -hmm. what? So if you're, if my doctor's through North Shore University Health System and he wanted to do X, Y, Z treatment and North Shore said that wasn't okay, he doesn't have the option to recommend it? Like even if Pretty something much. he believes in? Uh-huh, yep. <laughs> It gets even worse. I mean, I know I know North Shore physicians who literally say that they can't refer to me or they might lose their job. So, yeah. Oh yeah. Welcome to corporate healthcare. We can go on and on about that, but. <laughs> well, and and I had a doctor explain that she wouldn't um, or couldn't give a card for medical cannabis because her parent group doesn't believe in it and it instructed their doctors not to sign a card. Even though it's not a prescription, it's not, it, she just said, the bosses say no and I work for them. Yep. And it's a major North Shore group. Not yours, but a different one. Okay, next I was just curious if any of you are familiar with the research being done on neurodronic acid and how that may be helpful for CRPS. Um, whether it would be in addition to ketamine once it becomes available by the FDA or instead of, and what your thoughts are on the product. I don't even know who that is. This is for me. <laughs> uh, yeah, so there's some promising data coming out, as you know. Um, the question is really going to be, you know, again, everything come back to, comes back to mechanism of action. So, so nothing just happens magically. And I think, you know, we... we People out there, even physicians, sometimes think that, oh, you know, things are just magically happening, and it's because they don't understand the mechanism. At the end of the day, we're nothing more than just a bunch of organic wires, you know, organic nerves, organic electrical wires, and chemicals and compounds. That's all we are. And drugs are nothing more than chemical and compound. You have a chemical reaction, and certain things happen. So uh, my, my gut feeling is that, um, is that the mechanism of action is going to be, um, they're, they're going to find it's not like it's, it's necessarily you know, magically curing or helping CRPS. It's actually working on a certain mechanism that certain people with CRPS are exhibiting, and some proposed mechanisms are neuroinflammation. Um, other, obviously, more traditional um, explanations have been maybe bone density or bone loss, bone remineralization. So it's, it's going to be working on a certain mechanism that certain patients are exhibiting, and it's relieving that. Uh, that mechanism we know for sure is completely different than the NMDA receptor mechanism. So, so we may end up having two separate, you know, options. Well, multiple separate options, but two separate options, but they're not replacing each other. 
Okay, my timekeeper just told me I'm 15 minutes over. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have one question that is actually for Asuka. So if you could come over here, please, into the camera view. If I didn't get relief from a TENS unit, would the Asuka help? Sure, first of all, it's a great question. And if um, you know the world of medicine, it's all about acronyms. So does uh, anyone know what TENS means? Yeah, transcutaneous new electrical neural stem, right? So if you understand the mechanism of action, which I appreciate the medical speak behind me, I have a great uh, respect for. The uh, mechanism of action that occurs with a TENS device is it essentially trying to flood the nerve pathway with an electrical signal, which basically opens up the gateway of the nerve. So that's the consideration for relieving pain. However, that's a temporary action. So when that happens, you have this nerve sits to settle back down, tends to have the gates of the nerves tend to close back up again, which again stops electrical natural motion through the body in layman's terms, and basically pain returns, which is why you have to continue to use it over and over. The secondary part to that is that a TENS unit needs to be attached to the body, usually with an electrode, which sends a signal through the skin, hence the name TENS. And as it goes transcutaneous, a lot of people actually find that discomforting. Um, so that initial sensation of electrical power can be, um, can not just cause discomfort, but in some cases, and, and I used to work in that industry, it's about 25% of the patient base will actually have um, allergic reactions to the material inside the electrodes. So you add those up, and what you wind up having is burned skin, um, you have uh, rashes and all kinds of other things. So it's very invasive technology, uh, which CMS has now taken away uh, lots of different types of uh, reimbursements against. So an uh, OSCA device is based on a different technology called PEMF. Again, another acronym. Do we know what that means? Pulsed Electric Magnetic Field. And the mechanism of action of a PEMF device or an OSCA device is at a cellular level. So it's increasing and decreasing the polarity of the cells at a cellular level. So therefore, it doesn't need to be actually on the skin, which means that there's no impedance to actually delivering the signal to the cell so that cells can accelerate and flush out toxins and allow for cells to um, speed up recovery. And so it allows you to reduce inflammation, which increases the amount of healing time in the body and which also uh, allows for you to have reduction in pain without any kind of invasive uh, technology on your body. Thank you. I would like to thank every single one of you for all the time you have invested with us today. <laughs> all the Q&A and of, of course for sponsoring us, you know, your exhibit booths out there. We really appreciate all of your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you for Josh. having us. Thank you.